Last week, in the message, I shared the story about Jesus' baptism. We talked about his temptation in the desert, and we looked at those, those accounts because in those accounts, we, we found that Jesus is given his identity and his calling. And so when he went to the waters of baptism, and he comes up, he hears this voice from heaven call out, This is my beloved Son, in whom I'm well pleased. And those are the words we want to hear, aren't they? Those are the words we want to hear as well. And unfortunately, it doesn't always happen like that for us. And and immediately after his baptism, immediately after everybody heard the calling and the, the identity that was given to Jesus, then the devil came after him. The enemy came after him and said, If you really are the Son of God, if you really are the Son of God, if you really are the Son of God, And he begins to come after him, just like he does us. And so it's no real surprise that that the enemy would come after us in the same way, because he comes right after Jesus. And so we're no different. Jesus was tempted, says, in all ways like us. And so the question, though, becomes for us, where do we get our identity and our calling? If we don't hear the audible voice like Jesus heard... Where is it that we discover who we are and who are, who, whose we are and to what end and what purpose we are to live? Where do we, where do we discover our identity and our calling? Um, I'm convinced that it has to come from heaven. I'm convinced that it has to come from God, that it has to come from one who loves us. And why not the one who created us? Yes. Why not that very same father? And, and unfortunately, though, we live in a world where people find their identity in so many different areas. Um, they find their identity in their performance. You know, I am what I do. And, and we run into that. If you meet somebody for the first time, you know, one of the first questions you'll ask is, you know, so what do you do? Or what did you do before you retired? You know, those are the questions that we so often ask because we connect our identity with what we do. And that's that's not certainly the view of of God, um, but in our society where what we do is so valuable and so important, especially in a a performance-based society, there's a lot of pressure that comes that we've got to perform up to a certain level. And the world is what the world is. And, and things don't always work out, even with the best of intentions and even with the best of efforts. And our performance doesn't always measure up to what we want it to be or what we think it ought to be. And thus, we have a lot of pressure. And there's a lot of anxiety. And there's a lot of depression that goes on in these performance-based cultures. Um, addiction, mental illness, suicide. Especially if you go to a culture like Japan, where there's so much cultural pressure to perform that that the suicide rate is through the roof. In this highly developed Western-style culture has a great deal of pressure and anxiety that's put upon people who are looking for their identity in their performance. So that's really not the best way to to find your identity. And in possession, some people look to their possessions— as their, their self-worth and their identity. You know, I, I am what I have or what I wear or what I drive or, ha- or the house that I live in. And, and you know, even our, our fashion, the clothes that we wear can become an identity statement, right? You know, if, um, you know how many holes that you have in your jeans or you know, rips in your T-shirt or that sort of thing. I mean, all of this can become part of our identity, Right? And you can see different people in the way that they dress, and you can see that they, are, they identify with this group, and they identify with this crowd. Um, pleasure. Pleasure is a, a place where people look for their identity as well. I am what I want. And, and um, we know that this is pretty common in our culture as well. You know, whether it be, you know, I'm a playboy, I'm a ladies' man, I'm a, you know... I'm, a, I'm a, some kind of a sexy woman or, you know, whatever it is, I, I am what I want. And now we have, you know, I'm, I'm gay or I'm straight. I'm, you know, we find our identity 
in, in what we want. Popularity is another place where people look for their identity. I am what other people think of me. You know, it's like we never out, outgrew the high school cafeteria. You know, you're, you're always trying to measure up, and I wonder what Pastor David thinks of me. And, uh, you know, I'm looking for the pat on the back. I'm looking for some kind of acknowledgement that, that I've done well or, or that he approves. And we see that in social media today, right? I got a friend that calls Facebook fake book <clears throat> because we airbrushed and we, we put out there what we, what we want to identify with, right? Look at me. Look at who I am. Look at what I'm doing. Look at how much fun I'm having while you're sitting at home or while you're working out in the yard or look at me, I'm out on the beach. And that's what we longed to do when we were from Kansas. Um, <laughs> come to the, the sands of Florida on the beach. That's what Stephanie would, would d- die to be a part of, to, to come be a part of. But this popularity... You know, we want to be popular. We want people to like us. We want, want people to, to know us and to recognize us for, for what we think we are. But all of these areas, when we look for our identity and our popularity, or our pleasure, our possessions, our performance, all of these will fall short because they don't last. When our identity is tied with our self-worth and our security and our happiness, all of these things will fade away. And, you know, all my great good looks that I had in high school are <clears throat> slipping away, right? <laughs> my hair falls out, and, and my waist gets a little larger, and, and the joints ache a little more, and all of these things tend to fade away. And I've seen it with people who, who have their identity tied in what they do, or that when they retire— now who am I? Now what am I, now what am I going to do? When it's so tied to the house that I live in and I can no longer afford to live in this house or the health that we have, you know, where are we going to find our identity? One of the key tasks of our apprenticeship, our discipleship with Jesus, one of the key tasks is getting our identity and our calling from heaven And not from earth. Even though we don't hear an audible voice like Jesus heard at his baptism, we can hear from the Spirit of God. And we can hear from the Word of God. What is our identity? From the one who created us, the one who loves us, the one who made us, he will tell us who we are and what is our purpose in this world. So where do you get your identity and your calling from? If you had to answer that question, where would, you, where would you say that you find your identity? Is there one of those areas that we talked about that, that you tend to fall into more frequently than others? Well, Paul was a church planter and an early leader in the church, and, and he would start these churches, and, and he would work with them for— for several months or a couple of years, and then he would move on to another area and start another church, another work, and, and wanted to tell the gospel that Jesus has come and he's come with the kingdom of God and it's available for everybody. And this message that, that he was passionate about telling wasn't always well received with, with the movers and the shakers of the world. And so oftentimes, Jesus or Paul found the people who were receptive to the message of the gospel were the brokenhearted, were the slaves, were the women, were the outcasts of society, were the poor. And so Paul, when he arrives in Ephesus, uh, maybe late 40s, early 50s um, of the first century, he begins this church with a, with a handful of followers that, that begin to multiply, begin to grow. This gospel is exciting to them. That they're, they're excited to hear that it's available for them, that even they can receive the good news from God. And it's something that they have to look forward to. But then Paul goes on, and he goes on down the road, and he hears word that, 
that the people have forgotten the gospel, and they've strayed away, and they start dabbling into areas of sin, whether, whether it be gossip or slander or sexual immorality. And as they, he hears these messages, he decides, I need to write them a letter, and I need to give them some further instructions. And so when he writes the letter we, that we have and call the book of Ephesians, he spends the first three chapters reminding them who they are. He doesn't give them any commands, but he, he merely reminds them who you, who you are. And the passage of Scripture that we read, those 14 verses are all like one run-on sentence in the Greek. It just keeps going and going. Paul explains to them who they are. And I think that's crucial that we understand who we are because out of our understanding of who we are, whether it's the truth or the lies— whether it's the lies of the world and the lies of the enemy or the truth of God, out of our understanding of who we are is how we live. And you can, you can trace that back about every time pretty clear. So what flows out of your life in the form of the way that you live is, is a result of how you think and how you understand who you are. And so I want to look at a couple, maybe three of these images that Paul gives us here in the passage of Scripture of Ephesians 1. And the first one is the image of adoption. The image of adoption. Um, he says here, in love he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will. So he wants the Ephesians to remember that you are adopted. And it says here, sonship, and sometimes we get, we trip over that word and we think, well, what about us women, you know? Well, I don't want to be a son, <laughs> you know? I'm, I'm a female. So what's, what's going on here? Well, Paul, Paul isn't, you know, sliding women here, but he's using a very technical Greek word that, that talks about the inheritance, the full inheritance of a son. You see, women were second-class citizens. They didn't have the same, the same level of inheritance as, as, a, as a male child. And so Paul makes it very clear that you all are going to receive the same full inheritance. You're not slighted in any way, shape, or form. You get it all. And Paul, over and over again in his letters to his churches, he reminds them that there is no division, racial division. There's no Jew nor Greek. There's no Spanish or English speakers. There's, there's none of this. We are one in Christ. And we are one family in Christ. And so this adoption brings us together as one in Christ. God loves us, and, and he created us, and he loves us in the way that he created us. And he has a purpose for us in the way that we live. He's got a design for us to be image bearers of God. He's got a responsibility for us to, to manage his creation in the world that we live in. He's, he's given us that, but he wants, before he gives us any instructions, Paul wants us to be reminded who we are in Christ. And we are adopted in Christ. Well, sometimes it's hard for us to get a grasp on what that means because we read it with our, you know, 21st century eyes and ears. And, but in this culture where Paul is writing to the church at Ephesus, they had a, a different way of responding in the Roman culture uh, to, to children um, it was common when a child was born that that child be taken to the father, and then the father would have the responsibility of either accepting that child or rejecting that child. And, and they could re accept it or reject it based upon, well, I see maybe a deformity here, so I don't want to have a child that's, that's handicapped. They could reject it on, well, the sex, well, that's a, that's a female, and I don't want any more girls. I want, I want boys. Or they could reject it based upon, well, this is a child that was birthed from my mistress. And so I, I don't want that child. I've already got one of hers. I don't, I don't want to feed another mouth. And so what they would do is they would take these unwanted children, and in Ephesus in particular, they would take them outside the city 
near the, the garbage dump. And they'd leave the, these children out there near the garbage dump. And their belief was if the gods wanted them to survive, they would survive. And if they didn't, they would just die of the elements or the wild beast that would come in and take them up. And so some people in that culture would come along and they would see these discarded babies and, and they would make a determination themselves. Let's see. Yeah, I think I'll take this one. And there was one doctor um, in Pergamum, I think, that I remember reading about that, that he had done some studies and he'd, you know, figured out that the measurements of, you know, if the, the legs were this long and the arms were this long and the head and the body and the torso and all that, if they had these dimensions that this child would probably grow up to be, you know, this size, this, you know, strong and be good for a slave or, or prostitute or whatever. And so th th that was some of the work that was published at the time. And so some people would, would come along and they'd take these children and they'd raise them and then they would sell them on the slave market. Some people would take them and they would, you know, use them themselves as for whatever sexual immorality they wanted to be involved in. And, and then there were the Christians that over time began to, to go out and, and gather up these these unwanted children and these these christians who many of them were 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 poor themselves if not slaves themselves and they would try to raise these children as their own and bring them into their own family and and that was a form of adoption in that day that these unwanted children would be brought into the family and treated as their own paul writes to these people and says if, if you've come to know jesus then then you don't have to worry about who's rejected you maybe your father's rejected you maybe your family's rejected you you don't have to worry about that because creator god who loves you wants to adopt you into his family and so paul says remember that when you get discouraged and you get depressed because of the rejection that you're going through. He's remember that, that God wants to adopt you. He wants to give you the full rights of a legal heir that will receive the full inheritance, not a partial, the full inheritance of a son and daughter of Jesus. Isn't that exciting? Now, on this Father's Day, we were reminded just how powerful our influence is as fathers. Um... I had five kids myself with Stephanie, and now we've got three grandchildren, um, and I'm hoping that one day we'll even have more. But it's, it's hard to imagine how much more fun grandchildren are than your own children. <laughs> We're going to have our grandchildren for a few days this week, and, and the nice thing about it is we get them, and we can play with them, and we can have fun with them, and then we send them back with mom and dad and let them take them home. <laughs> And then I can go back to sleeping and full night sleep and not having to worry, get rested up, recuperate. But fathers have an incredible amount of influence on their families and on their children. And, and we have the opportunity to bless our children or to almost curse our children. And the words that we say. And so sometimes, you know, we hear loving words from a father that, that builds up and encourages the children, you know, that, that that's all right. Dad loves you. Don't worry about it. Don't let that bother you. And, and they encourage them and build them up. And then we have dads that, that aren't quite so careful with their words. And they'll say things like, I can't believe how fat you are. How stupid you are. You're never going to amount to anything. I've had a lot of adults in my office over the years that come and, and share stories of, of the words, hurting words that their father would say. And sometimes I, I'm convinced that the father wasn't trying to be mean and vindictive or hurtful on purpose, but those words just came out. And, and they came with a great deal of harm. But the most common effect that fathers have the, is not 
the positive or the negative words, but it's the no words that they offer their children today. They have so little role in them because they're, they're themselves busy in their own life, absorbed in trying to find their meaning and find their identity themselves, that they don't have time to, to invest in their children. And so they don't speak to them. They just are focused on themselves. And sometimes they're, they numb themselves in their own pain that they are going through with alcohol or drugs, and they don't spend time at all with their kids, and, and so they have these absentee fathers. They even might even be in the house, but they're still absent. They're not given the influence that, that fathers are meant to give. And you can see the, the results of this absentee fathers in our culture today. Children are four times more likely to live in poverty, to have mental health issues, seven times more likely to become pregnant as a teen. And the vast majority of, of people in prison today had an absentee father. So we have a responsibility um, to, to reflect the father's love in our own families. And even if our kids are out of the house, and even if we're having grandkids or great-grandkids like Suzanne was showing me a, a great-grandchild born, even if, even if we're having children that are born and grandchildren and great-grandchildren, we can, we can still have an influence in their life. We can bless them and pray for them and reflect Jesus to them at every opportunity. But there's another image that, that I want that Paul uses here in Ephesus. It's the image of redemption. And Ephesus, for about 1,000 years or 1,500 years, they say Ephesus had the largest slave market in the world. And so it was pretty common practice to see people bought and sold as slaves. It was just the world that they lived in. You can Google it up yourself, those three words, Ephesus slave trade, and you'll read all kinds of stories about what went on in this world. And so Paul writes to this kind of environment where slavery was common, where that was just the norm, where, where families were broken apart, where people were treated like cattle, bought and, and sold. But on occasion, because... An owner might have been merciful or gracious or kind or good. They would redeem a slave and, and give them their freedom on occasion. That, that didn't happen real often because that was money. And why would I do that? And they're just a slave, right? They have no value. You know, men, women, slaves, animals, just treated like that. So Christianity comes along, and we talk about a, a loving creator God who doesn't make any junk, right? Who, who creates everyone with the image of God. And, and this is a new message, and a, a new message for these slaves to hear that they've never heard before because they've been told they're worthless. They're, they've been told they're, the only value that they have is what they can do, what they can produce. And they were abused not just physically, but sexually. It was pretty rampant in that world that they lived in. And Christianity comes along and says, God loves you so much that he has sent his son to die on the cross to redeem you. <clears throat> so you can imagine how that message was received. A God would love us, that he would give his life to redeem us to buy us, to pay our price, to set us free. That's incredible. And so Paul says, you've got to remember that you're adopted. You've got to remember that you've been redeemed. You cannot, you cannot, you cannot forget that. That our Heavenly Father loves you so very much. I don't care that you're a slave right now. I don't care that your master treats you poorly. I don't care that, that they abuse you sexually, physically. God loves you. Remember who you are. So valuable that Jesus would come and die in your place. We live in a world <clears throat> that 
We, we experience the now and the not yet of the kingdom of God. When Jesus came, he came and he brought the kingdom of God here now. But yet we don't see it in its fullness, in its consummation. And so we live in the now and the not yet. And so we can experience unspeakable joy and peace and love in this world that we live in right here and right now. And yet we can look around and we can see the effects of sin all over. The kingdom of God is here and available to each and every one of us. It's not fully consummated yet. But one day, there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth as, as they're joined together. One day, there's going to be no more sin and no more sorrow. One day. So we look forward to the future. Our identity is not bound on our past and it's not bound even in the present. But we look forward to the future of who we are in Christ. Sons and daughters of the living God. Valuable possessions that he so loves that he would spare no expense to, to restore in right relationship. On May 13th, <clears throat> 1989, Stephanie and I were married. So here we are walking out, <clears throat> and Stephanie's thinking, what did I just do? <laughs> On that day, I became a husband. And that was my status as a husband. I became a husband. And the question is, was I a good husband or a bad husband? Well, I don't want to answer that one. <laughs> Stephanie and I, one of the things that we did would, um, on occasion, when, when I would do a, a wedding ceremony, after the ceremony, six months or so later, I'd try to bring the couple back and we'd have a conversation with them and talk to them about how things are going later on. I'd like to bring Stephanie in every opportunity I had because she had a different perspective than mine. And so I remember one time sitting here talking to this couple, and they were, you know, not... The honeymoon was over, and, and they were talking about that. And Stephanie said, oh, I hated Andy. <laughs> right after we got married, I thought, what in the world did I do? So I, I know that I probably wasn't a very good husband early on, but I hope over the years that I've become a little better husband. Kind of the, the now and the not yet. On December 12th, 1991, my first child was born. And I remember you just being overwhelmed seeing this, this baby boy who's now planting and pastoring a church in Largo. Um, how excited I was and and absolutely how, how stupid I was, how ignorant I was about what needed to be done as a father. So my, my status as a father hasn't changed, but hopefully over, over the years of raising these five children, I've learned a few things along the way. Unfortunately now, they're out of the house, and I'm, I'm a lot smarter now than I was, and I hope, I hope that I'm a lot better father now than I was. But my... My status as a father hadn't changed, but the now and the not yet, well, there's something that I'm looking forward to in the kingdom of God when we are come together in the presence of God with all God's people. We are a child of the king. We've been adopted into his family. We have the full rights and privileges of being sons and daughters of the most high God. And the first three chapters of Paul, he reminds them over and over again, remember who you are, remember who you are, remember, remember, remember. And then finally in chapter 4, he finally gets around to, to giving them some instruction. If it were me, and I'm writing that letter, point number one, <laughs> knock it off, guys, you know. All this nonsense I'm hearing about gossip and slander and sexual immorality. Quit it. Stop it. You know, that, that's my first line. But Paul, inspired by the Holy Spirit, reminds them, remember, remember, remember who you are. And then he gets into the instructions. And he starts it off in chapter 4. I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling that you have received. I urge you. In light of who you are to live a life worthy of the calling you've received. 
I'm going to close the message with, a, with an illustration from the movie Saving Private Ryan. This movie tells about this James Ryan who had three brothers who were enlisted in World War II. And I think two of the brothers died on D-Day in the invasion of Normandy. And another brother died in the Pacific Theater. And so when word gets around that this mother is going to lose three of her four sons on the same day and be notified of the same day, the military decided we can't let this happen to the fourth son as well. And so after the invasion of Normandy, Captain Miller um, suffers a great deal of loss in his battalion. And a lot of people were killed. Uh, his ranger crew were killed. And, and he receives a message to, to take eight out of his company and to go and to find this James Ryan, this Private Ryan, and get him back home safely. And so they spend the time in the movie trying to locate where he is, and, and in this process of finding him, six of the eight rangers are killed. And at one point in the time, these men are risking their lives trying to find this this private Ryan so they can send him back home. And at one point, you know, they're, they're frustrated. And, and they say, this Ryan better be worth it. Captain Miller said, he better go home and cure some disease or invent some new longer lasting light bulb or do something great for all the effort, for all the work, for all the sacrifices going for him. And despite this, these misgivings, Captain Miller presses on and they find him. And in the final battle scene, Captain Miller is fatally wounded, and, and Private Ryan comes to him and has this awareness of the sacrifice that's been made for him. And Captain Miller whispers with his last dying breath, earn this, earn this. And then the movie moves to scene about 50 years later. And the elderly James Ryan, the former Private Ryan, he's standing over Captain Miller's grave. And he's fully aware of the six lives that were sacrificed so that he could be brought back. And, and he falls to his knees at the cemetery of Captain Miller and with a trembling voice, he says, every day I think about what you said to me that day on the bridge. I've tried to live my life the best I could. I hope that was enough. I hope I've earned what you did for me. And then his wife comes beside him and, and he tells her with tears in his eyes, tell me that I've lived a good life. Tell me that I'm a good man. And this illustration is, it fails to compare what God has done for us. And that he came sending his son to come and die in our place to save us, to rescue us, to restore us. The sacrifice that Jesus and the Heavenly Father made on our behalf is remarkable. And we can never earn it. We can never earn it. We can never earn it. No matter how much we do, we will never earn our salvation. It's by the grace of God that He loves us. And he comes out for us. He adopted us. He paid for us. We are his. That's who we are. And in light of this, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling that you have received. When I remember how much God loves me, I serve him differently. When I remember how much he has sacrificed for me, yes, yes. it's so much easier for me to be generous. When I remember how much grace has been poured out of my life, it's easy for me to be graceful right. and merciful to others. Yes. When I remember who I am, I live differently. We desperately need to remember who we are. Yes. Knowing our primary identity of sons and daughters of the Most High God. Where do you get your identity and calling from?
Where do you find your identity and your calling? How about turn to a creator God who loves you with an agape love, with a divine love that we can't fully explain. Our God is a good God. Our God is a loving God. He's a wonderful Heavenly Father. And so we rejoice and we celebrate what He has done for us in the way that we live our life here in this world, in the, in the now and not yet. The future's coming. And it's coming faster than, than we'd like to see it come sometimes. And we're all going to stand before our Heavenly Father who loved us so much and give an account for our life to the good, good Father, and He'll do what's right. Um, I'm going to ask the worship team, they're going to come and lead us in a, in a closing song. Um, but as they come, we just pause for a moment and, and think about our Heavenly Father that loves us. Some of us need to go back and we need to reread the first three chapters of Ephesians. And we might need to reread them each and every day for a week or a month. And let that soak in who we are. What he has done for us. Before we try to go out and earn anything with God, we need to recognize what he has done for us and how much he loves us. Father, we thank you. I pray that we would not forget on this Father's Day 2021 that we'd be reminded of your great love for us. Amazing, indescribable, incredible love for us. Help us to live a life worthy of our calling.
Come lay them down at the foot of the cross. Jesus is waiting. God so loved the world. Amen. <laughs> encourage you all to go in his peace. God loves us. He has adopted us. He has redeemed us. Go in peace.